in fifth grade, I pledged allegiance to a drug-free future through my school's D.A.R.E. program, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Community police officers, along with my good friend, Darren the Lion, taught me and my classmates to say no to drugs. To help us practice, we did a lot of skits, like this one. Hey, kid, want to go to the playground later to smoke some grass? <gasps> no! Marijuana is a gateway drug! Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Debating for America's Youth. Today, we have another very special guest. Today, we're interviewing Jordan Allen, who is the 2019 NSDA National Champion in Informative Speaking. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I want to just begin with a simple question. How did you first hear about speech and debate and what made you want to stick with the activity? So I started speech and debate when I was in middle school. So it was a cool elective that you had to um, you had to be selected to, to in, order, in order to participate. So that's where I started. It was super selective, so it was something that I was interested in. And ever since I started, I continued with it. I actually started in PF, and then throughout high school, I switched over to speech because debate was a little too much taxing on my schedule. That makes sense. Yeah, and then um, what did you specifically like about informative speaking? What I liked about informative was it was different. It was a very new event. When I started doing informative, it was only its second year. So it gave me a lot of space to figure out what I wanted to do. There was no concreteness. Like you look at with um, categories such as original oratory, there's a way that things have to be done because the event has been going on for so many years. So what I liked about informative was the flexibility to be myself and basically define what I wanted this event to be. Definitely. And then talking about your the, your, specific, your specific piece, how did you find your piece? And like, well, I guess, how did you come up with your piece? And what inspired you to actually perform that at Nationals? Um, well, in 2017, 2017 or 2018, it was 2017. So in 2017, um, I did a speech at Nationals, which I was the runner up for called The Birds and the Weaves. And so when I was going in for my senior year, I wanted to come up with something that was once again going to amplify the voices and the struggles of my community, but also something that everybody could relate to, you know? So the Birds in the Weeds speech was very specific to a very specific audience for people who were not African-American, who didn't understand the struggles of having Afro-textured hair. So what I wanted to do was bring my community a part of the conversation instead of, you know, having a different perspective or having non-black people has as the audience so i definitely wanted to bring my community in but also use a topic that is very misunderstood not only for african americans but for you know the better world as a whole because marijuana has so many implications uh, beyond recreational uses so i definitely wanted to bring that to light Definitely. And I thought your Birds in the Wii speech was actually very incredible. Um, as someone who's not personally a part of the African-American community, I even found it very interesting and a really great piece. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so when um, when you're you know writing your speech out, how do you find props to use? And kind of what is your process in making your boards and, and using, because like, unlike in, uh, original oratory, as you talked about, you can actually use props. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I usually write the entire speech first. So that that's the first thing you want to get out the way. And then when I'm going through my speech, I ask myself, what type of board, and if I do have a board, how can it aid the understanding of my viewers? So um, when it comes to the board for the birds and the weeds, I always have a backboard. And my goal for that one is for people to question what this speech is about, but not really have a, a huge idea about it. Um, so that's what I do with my backboard, but for the other boards, I just always ask myself, is this going to aid my viewer or is it going to hinder them paying attention to me as a speaker? And with the constructing of the boards, the majority of my boards are just pictures of what I'm talking about. But when it comes to whether or not I'm going to have something that pulls out or a magnet, yeah, I really just go through and think about what's different for the audience because I don't want the audience to know what I'm going to do. 
that's why I don't make everything a magnet, but I also want to make sure it's interactive. So that's a lot of a lot of the questions that I ask myself when I'm putting together my boards. Yeah. And then how do you find the balance because you are an informative speaking when you're actually writing your speech between the informative side and the more entertaining side of your speech? Um so I definitely try and go the route of storytelling. Uh, it's something that you see very often in original oratory and it's very effective and informative as well because through storytelling people are more perceptive to hear what you're trying to say so that's how I usually blend my humor with my facts but what I try to do is write all the facts what do I want my audience to take away from this speech you know and then you weave in the jokes the jokes are usually the last part that you do write into the speech because you want to make sure you're getting the proper information out to your audience Definitely. And when you're practicing, um, what kind of practices do you do to get better at general speaking, but also to get better at your speech in particular? Um, well, I have a background in musical theater. So speaking to people has always come natural to me, especially because you can become somebody that you're not, you know? So for a lot of people who have fears of public speaking, what I would always recommend is imagine that it's not you. So that's definitely what I do sometimes. And I always believe that I'm not the one who's speaking, but I'm also a religious person. So I believe that God is speaking through me. And so that's how I don't, I guess, focus on the practicing and things like that, because what I try to do is make it natural. And that's why one of the problems I have with speech and debate is it teaches us to get up and, you know, just recite a speech. And it doesn't allow for us to understand the importance of natural public speaking and natural communication skills. So every time that I practice, I try to imagine myself sitting down and having a conversation with somebody and trying to get that information off in a relatable and, you know, an easy way for them to understand. Definitely. I think you did a very great job of that in your speech, but when you're on the big stage at nationals, how do you uh, overcome your nerves speaking in front of thousands of people? Um, well, I definitely say it's something that I've come used, become used to, especially, like I said, growing up in theater, it's actually, which is kind of comical, is it's easier for me to speak in front of thousands of people rather than, you know, a couple people. Because the, the thing about speaking in front of like, you know, millions of people is you don't actually see them. So that actually becomes a benefit when you're standing up there, you really just see a black, a black screen, really. And so, but when you're in more intimate spaces, you actually have to put, look people in the eyes and things like that. And it's a lot more intimate, but I definitely say for me personally, it's easier to speak on those types of platforms. I will agree with you. I've spoken uh, in front of large audiences before on stage and when the lights are on you, you the lights kind of like black out all the right. people, you can't see anyone. And so I guess it really does take down some of the nerves that you have. Right. Uh, um, so, what would you tell a novice who's just getting started in informative speaking? I would definitely say speak about something that you're passionate about. Um, the best skills that you can learn out of speech and debate, but more importantly, the people who usually go the furthest when it comes to competitions are people who are speaking about things that they're passionate about. Because believe it or not, when you're speaking about something that's dear to your heart, it's very obvious and it comes off more natural to judges and audiences, which makes us more perceptible to listen to you. Definitely, I, I agree. Because yeah, you can tell when someone's just giving a speech just to give it versus they actually are interested in the topic, especially in the speech events that you get to choose the topic for. Right. Yeah. Um, what's some advice you wish you knew um, either earlier during your high school and middle school speech and debate experience, or even now that you've graduated from high school in for speech and debate? Um, I definitely say it's not about the trophy. It's not about walking away with first place. It's really about using the platform that speech and debate gives you to speak up for other people, to amplify other voices and bring to attention the, the injustices that are occurring within our nation and within the world to that extent. And so when you focus on, you know, the power that speech and debate gives you to have a platform for you as a student, for, for people to actually listen to you and take time out to, you know, hear what you have to say, it's so much bigger than a trophy. And when you focus on how you can impact the lives of the people that are in the audience, not only will you do better, but when you step away from speech and debate, you'll understand the true power that your voice holds. 
Definitely. You talked about how you moved away from PF and moved towards informative speaking. Do you usually stick with one performance for the year or do you change it up or do you have multiple that you like use off and on during the year? So um, I always have the same one for um, an individual category. So the events that I participated in was program oral interpre interpretation. Um, I did OO one year info and there was another one. I can't remember the other event I did, but I would start my speeches at the beginning of the year and I would keep that same speech throughout the year and I would just revise it as I went. Definitely. And then uh, and, and in closing of this interview, I, this might be a little bit repetitive for the question about the advice, but if you would like to say something to the entire or most some of speech, the speech and debate community that watch these videos, what would you like to just say to the community? I definitely want to say never underestimate the power of your voice because somebody is always in the audience listening. Somebody is always being inspired and somebody is always being empowered as well. And when you think about when you speak that somebody in the audience is moved by it or it changes their life, because there's always somebody whose life will be changed, you will understand the power that your voice literally has to change the world. And you know, it may be, you may think that it's small at some times, but it's small things that create a big change. So never underestimate the power that your voice has with even in small arenas such as speech and debate, but always use your voice further than that. Because when we all, when all the people who are in speech and debate who effectively know how to use their voice, use it in the real world, then we are definitely on the right track to making the world a better place. Definitely agree with you. And I think it's really cool to see speech and debate like students go out and like do real things. Like we've seen <laughs> a lot of like uh, advocacy from teenagers in speech and debate and movements like that. So I think that's really cool. Right. They're definitely transferable skills. And when we understand that, this community of speech and debate really does have the power to change the world. So it's pretty cool. Definitely. Yeah. And it goes from just talking about an issue to actually making a real change on the issue. Right. And what's funny about that is my, um, my freshman year, I was actually kind of frustrated with speech and debate. And I wrote an original oratory about how speech and debate was useless because we come together and we talk about all these problems and we come up with all these solutions, even when you think about debate, but we never give them to anybody to actually create tangible change. But what I'm starting to see is like speech and debaters taking it to the next level, you know, going to their congressman or going to, you know, speak on public platforms to make sure their voices is, is are heard. And it's just such a powerful thing and such a motivational thing to see. So I'm very excited with the things that are in store for this community. Definitely. I completely agree. And thank you so much for coming on this interview and helping uh, other speech and debate members. Of course. Thank you for having me. And I hope you have a great day. Yeah, you too.